Hello, and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today, I'll be talking about Season 3, Episode 19, The Limo. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well out there. I'm doing great. I um, I'm doing something a little different today. I'm recording pretty early in the morning, which I usually don't do. Uh, it's very cold today, and so I'm waiting for the weather to warm up. Usually, I have my walk in the morning. I walk about four and a half miles. You don't need to know my whole schedule, but um, anyway, if my voice sounds a little bit low and like I just woke up, it's because. Well, I did. Well, I woke up about an hour and a half ago. But anyway, if my voice is a little bit deeper, that's why. Other than that, (laughs) other than my schedule, now that you're up to date on that, I, um, gosh, I have gotten addicted to RuPaul's Drag Race. I know I'm super late to this party. I've been meaning to get to the party. So many people I know have been like, how can you not be watching this? It's so good. I am catching up on Hulu and it does not disappoint. It is so incredibly entertaining and really educational, I have to say. I've learned a lot about the drag community, about what that means and the history of it and the first, oh my goodness, the effort that these men put in to their career as drag queens. I'm totally in love with RuPaul, by the way, too. Um, anyway, <laughs> my, my knowledge of RuPaul was pretty minimal. I mean, I knew, you better work, cover girl, work it girl, do a twirl. I mean, I knew all that, of course. But beyond that, I uh, wasn't, I uh, didn't know a lot about him. So it's been pretty, uh, pretty entertaining. Such a great escape. I think we can all use an escape every hour on the hour, you know, like traffic and weather. It's been that and it's been so entertaining and just something light to get your mind off of, well, a lot of upsetting things in this day and age. (laughs) So I highly recommend it. RuPaul's Drag Race. It's on Hulu. All right, so let's get into this episode, The Limo. The synopsis from my coffee table book is as follows. Jerry and George take a limo designated for a passenger who Jerry knows wasn't on the plane. The limo driver, oblivious to the ruse, takes them to Madison Square Garden for a scheduled event, which the guys assume is a basketball game. They invite Elaine and Kramer to join them in the limo, but by the time they're picked up, it's clear that they are posing as leaders of the Aryan Union. This episode is written by Larry Charles. Okay, before I get into this, it's pretty Elaine light. So I will be kind of rapid fire going through these scenes before Elaine gets there. And then even the scenes with Elaine, spoiler alert, there's not a lot of substance. So I foresee a very quick episode this week. So in the first scene, we see George looking at a screen and he's frantic. He's trying to find Jerry's flight, but he can't see it. He's asking this guy next to him who seems to be not interested in talking to George at all. He asks for the time. The guy just tells George, look at the clock on the wall. But you're wearing a watch. It's right over there by the escalator. And so George aggressively tries to grab his arm. What are you, some kind of nut? Walks away. George says, my favorite line, you know, we're living in a society. Then we see Jerry. He just got off his plane. His flight was delayed. Well, it doesn't matter because George had just gotten there. His car broke down on the Belt Parkway. It started shaking, really violently shaking. And then Jerry notices a chauffeur with a sign that reads O'Brien. And he says to George, I'll tell you one thing, O'Brien isn't showing up. They wouldn't let him on the plane. The flight was overbooked and he was making a scene in Chicago. And George gets an idea. Well, maybe we should take his limo. And Jerry's like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. I do like the exchange and how they're like, 10 year old kids where Jerry's a little annoyed. Well, if you're going to be O'Brien, why can't I be somebody? Who do you want to be? Dylan Murphy. I like Dylan. I like that little exchange. (laughs) They approach the driver of the limo. He takes Jerry's bag and asks them to follow him. Dylan, Callan. The next scene, they're in the limo and they are just giddy. Oh my gosh, they can't believe they're doing this. It's just such a rush. There's a phone in there. So George calls his mom, (laughs) immediately gets into a fight with her. How's this? I'm never telling you. Never. Is she happy for you? They ask the driver where they're going. And he says, Madison Square Garden. I have the four passes. Oh, right, they say. Madison Square Garden. (gasps) Wait a second. George remembers. The Knicks are playing the Bulls tonight. 
we're going to see Michael Jordan. Oh, my God. They're so excited. Then Jerry calls Elaine from the limo phone and tells her that they're going to the next game. Tell Kramer, meet them at the corner. They're picking them up in a limo. That's right, baby doll. Oh, and one more thing. George is O'Brien and I'm Murphy. Yes, I'm serious. They tell the driver, hey, we need to make a stop first. I know. He knows. And they're pulling off on this exit. Oh, no. What's this about? Picking up the other members of your party? Oh, right. The other members of a party. Other members of a party? What other members of a party? I didn't even know we were in a party. <laughs> I like how fast George says it. He says it way better than I just did. And now they're like, oh, man, the jig is up. It was a bad jig to begin with. It was a good jig. So what are we going to do? Well, maybe we'll just jump out. Jump out? We're doing 60 miles an hour. So you jump and roll. You don't get hurt. Oh, but then they start slowing down. Are those the people? Jerry tells George, just put your arm over your head. to Pretend you're sleeping. Then a man and a woman enter the limo and sit down. They're pleasant. And Ava turns to Jerry with her arm extended. Mr. O'Brien. Oh, no, I'm I'm not Mr. O'Brien. He's, he's sleeping right now. He had a long trip. So Ava tells Jerry, we're so excited to meet him face to face. We're faithful readers of his newsletter and his book, The Big Game. Oh, so you've never seen him before? No. Not even a picture on the book jacket? There was no picture on the book jacket. Come on, O'Brien, wake up. <laughs> and then George wakes up and says, hello, I'm O'Brien. Now, the woman whose name is Ava in the episode, she's played by Susanna Snyder. She guest starred in pretty much every popular show in the 80s and a few in the 90s, including Seinfeld, of course. Now, she will return in a later episode, the pie episode, as Audrey, who's Poppy's daughter, and she wouldn't try the apple pie. I think she's very good in this episode. You know, she has an interesting role to play, a Nazi fangirl who is super intense. And I think she pulls it off really well. She's got a great quality where she is charming. I can see, oddly enough, I can sort of see why George is not super bothered that she's a Nazi because she's very cute and very charming. And well, you know, um, is willing to die for him, as we find out later. But uh, uh, I think she does a really good job with this role. I don't think it's a very easy thing to pull off. Real quick, I wanted to cover another Gilmore Girls Seinfeld connection. Tim, the other neo-Nazi in the car with Ava, is played by Peter Krause, very recognizable, uh, very successful actor. He starred in Six Feet Under, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. I keep meaning to rewatch it. I I just remember when I watched it for the first time. I didn't watch it while it was airing, but I did catch up on it uh, later on whatever, HBO Max or whatever. And um, oh, my God. Just love it. And I love Michael C. Hall, too. Anyway, it's a fantastic show. And Peter Krause was one of the stars of that show. And then he went on to star in Parenthood, which is another hugely successful show. I didn't watch that one, but everyone seemed to love it. And um, so his connection to Gilmore Girls is a bit unique. He did appear in the reboot, A Year in the Life, that came out in 2016. He had a cameo as a park ranger. And he got that because, well, he's been Lauren Graham's boyfriend in real life for a number of years. Lauren Graham is the star of Gilmore Girls. She plays Lorelai Gilmore. And she will appear in a later season of Seinfeld as well. So, I mean, there's so many. Gil- there's a reason I do this. <laughs> I hope a lot of you don't get annoyed that I do this. But I'm going to do it no matter what, uh, because I. it's amazing how many Gilmore Girl and Seinfeld connections there are. So anyway, just needed to point that out. The connection of Peter Krause being in Seinfeld and Gilmore Girls. Next, we're on the street corner. Yay, finally an Elaine scene. Elaine arrives in a cab. Kramer's already waiting out there. And he says, well, you took a cab? Yeah. How much money do you make? (laughs) I'm not telling you. I'll tell you how much I make. I know how much you make. Elaine's not that excited. I don't even know why I'm doing this. I don't even like basketball. Well, have you ever seen Michael Jordan? only in those commercials. And then Kramer feels the need to show her one of his 360 dunks that Michael Jordan does. (laughs) And of course, what does Kramer do? He just does one very badly um, and then crashes into a bunch of trash cans on the street. (laughs) The purpose of the scene, we're finally seeing Elaine and Kramer and their contribution to the episode, just establishing their position on this uh, street corner and waiting on Jerry and George. Uh, My take, it's a short scene. And all the humor is really given to Kramer, mostly in physical form with that dunk. (laughs) I do like that short interaction about how much Elaine makes. 
it's just classic Kramer to ask that question only based on the fact that she took a cab. I really wish there was more to that conversation, but we don't get it. Um, So there's not much else to say. Moving on. We're back in the limo. And now Jerry and George are making little small talk with Ava and Tim. Ava is just gushing to George how much she loves him and well O'Brien not him and that O'Brien really has changed her life the way you analyze the game and identify the major players oh it left me breathless just goes on to tell him he's a brilliant man I think what we're supposed to think is that because they're going to a basketball game I think maybe we're supposed to believe that George and Jerry think that the game means basketball. So he's like, "Eh, it's just a game. (laughs) Oh, he's so humble. The fate of the world depends on the outcome of this game. (laughs) Then Ava drops a bomb. We're really looking forward to your speech tonight. Uh, uh, My speech. Your secretary faxed me a copy. Would you want to look it over? You may as well look it over. (laughs) Something's fishy here. The next scene, we're back on the street corner. Kramer's trying to figure this out. So he's like, what what did he say? And Elaine's just explaining the phone call, you know. Well, I thought George picked him up from the airport. Yeah, he did. Well, then why are they taking a limo? I don't know. Was there anything else? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, He said to call them O'Brien and Murphy. What? O'Brien? Why (laughs) O'Brien? The purpose of this scene, we see Kramer getting some more information about what Jerry and George are up to. And we see that he's getting pretty suspicious. My take, uh, what can I say? There's really no humor. It's just to get this information out. Elaine confuses Kramer with all the information, and that's about it. (laughs) We're back in the limo now. George is reading his, well, Nazi speech. It's pretty alarming. And then they hear a noise outside, and George thinks it's shooting, and the limo pulls over. Ava throws herself on top of George and says, I'm ready to die for you. I would do anything for you. Tim had gone out to see what was going on. He comes back and says, nothing to worry about. It's just a flat tire. But, you know, if anything does go down, we're prepared. He opens a suitcase full of guns. Ava takes one out and pretty much starts molesting it. (laughs) Nice looking Luger. We cut to a reporter, Jody Baskerville. It's her news report talking about uh, what's going down outside Madison Square Garden. There's a crowd forming and it seems like it's going to get pretty heated and uh, maybe violent. Now, Jody Baskerville was an actual newscaster, which is not surprising. She does a great job playing a newscaster. <laughs> and I did a little research. She's gone on to be a pretty prolific producer. She produces a bunch of reality television, so seems like she's done very well for herself. Okay, and I'm just going to point this out, guys. Uh, the leader of the Aryan Union in this episode is Donald O'Brien. A leader of the neo-Nazi movement is named Donald. Hmm. Moving on. We're back on the street corner. Kramer won't let this go. O'Brien, O'Brien, why O'Brien? And then a friend of Elaine comes up to greet her. His name is Dan. Hi, Dan. She introduces him to Kramer. and Kramer gives him a very friendly yet aggressive handshake. And Dan says, yeah, he's headed downtown uh, to the big protest. The head of the Aryan Union supposed to be there and that they should come. And she's like, oh, well, we can't. We're going to the Knicks Bulls game. Oh, well, that's where the rally is, right next door. He's really supposed to be something. It's the first time he's ever been seen in public. Who? The head of the Aryan Union. O'Brien. The purpose of this scene, we see the stories converge after Elaine's friend Dan informs them about this rally and who O'Brien is. And, you know, the very tail end of the scene, we we see Kramer have this realization. And my take, it's just another really transactional scene. Very little comedy and certainly zero comedy for Elaine. So we're back at the limo. The tire is being changed and George is sort of enamored at how cute a Nazi Ava is. (laughs) Jerry's like, what? She's a Nazi, George. I know. And Jerry says, let's just make a run for it. And George can't run. He's got a bad hamstring because of the tight sheets in a hotel. (laughs) So then he says, well, I'll call the police from the limo. But as soon as he gets on the phone, Tim gets back in the car and George has to make up that uh, AstroTurf. You know who's responsible for that? The Jews. Jews hate grass. Always have. Always will. George wants to talk to Jerry some more by themselves. So he asks Tim to excuse them. Well, with all due respect, sir, we're about to leave. And then George uses his persona as O'Brien to intimidate Tim out of the car and says, I think you forgot something. I'm sorry. Once he's out, they say, okay, what are we going to do? You know, 
what? When we go to pick up Kramer and Elaine, we'll just get out. They can't shoot us in the city. (laughs) Nah, that doesn't really make sense either. So we're back on the street corner now. Kramer is at like peak suspicion. He just can sense something's wrong. I can feel it. And then he just says, oh my gosh, Jerry is O'Brien. He's he's the leader of the Aryan Union. Jerry's a Nazi? He's so clean and organized. Come on. Oh, Elaine can't take it. Look, you idiot. Just calm down. I know Jerry's not a Nazi. You don't think so, huh? No, he's just neat. Purpose of this scene... Well, Kramer is a conspiracy theorist. (laughs) I'm sure he would have a field day today. And my take, Elaine's only purpose here is to absorb all of Kramer's comedic moments. She's the straight role, you know, to his comedy. Back at the limo, George is whistling If I Were a Rich Man from Fiddler on the Roof, which probably isn't the right thing to be whistling in a limo with neo-Nazis. And you can see Tim getting a little bit suspicious. Starts questioning them. You don't really look like an O'Brien and Jerry doesn't look like a Murphy. Yeah, Tim. Tim's on to them. Back on the street corner, Kramer has shifted his conspiracy theory now. Well, maybe they work for the CIA. You know, he's too normal to be a comedian. Well, what about George? Well, his whole personality is a disguise. I mean, I bet they know who killed Kennedy. <laughs> sort of a callback to the whole JFK thing in the last episode. And he's just going down in this spiral, just won't stop. (laughs) Finally, he just looks to Elaine and says, I won't let them hurt you. I won't let them hurt you. And sort of hugs Elaine, but really just pushes her face up against him. She's pushing him off, saying, Kramer, stop. And at that moment, Jerry and George pull up. And as soon as the door opens, Kramer says, hey, O'Brien. And then there's these guys at the bus stop, and they hear Kramer say that, and they start charging at them. One of them has like a big old wooden two by four or whatever in his hand. They all hop in the limo and speed off. Purpose of this scene, Kramer is still in his little conspiracy theory spiral. And uh, we also see the stories converge when Jerry and George arrive. And my take, I mean, there's no comedy at all for Elaine. Now, this was a VHS episode for me. I had this on tape, so I remember watching this episode a lot. And I used to think the part where Kramer hugs Elaine was kind of funny. I used to laugh at it. But I mean, because he, look, he basically like smashes her face into his chest. But watching it again, it's kind of upsetting (laughs) because she's yelling, you're hurting me, Kramer, you're hurting me. I don't know. I'm like, oh, don't don't get the same feeling anymore. And this is where the scene is kind of where the episode gets too off the rails for me. It's already a little bit farcical. So once we have these angry guys from the bus stop, like running after the limo, I'm like, what is this? (laughs) The next scene, they're all in the limo. Kramer makes the mistake of calling Jerry O'Brien and George Murphy. And Jerry tries to explain it, saying, oh, no, he's he's cross-eyed. The phone rings. Of course, Kramer answers it. Ava, it's for me. As she gets on the phone, she looks at Tim. It's O'Brien. Then we cut to Ava and Tim holding the four at gunpoint. Then we cut really quick to Jody Baskerville. The angry mob is getting even angrier and bigger. Back at the limo, everyone is speaking at once, trying to explain what happened, except for Kramer. Kramer's just kind of staring at everyone. As soon as they all kind of stop with their explanations, Ava screams, get out! There is an angry mob around the limo, and as they're trying to get out, Elaine spots Dan at the front outside the windshield, and he sees her. Elaine? And then we cut to a really quick scene of George at the podium screaming, I'm not O'Brien! I'm not O'Brien! The purpose of this scene, it's the resolution to the entire episode. Um, And my take, it's, you know, very over the top. I'm not really a fan. But in the spirit of being a little bit more positive, I will point out a couple of things I did like. I do love how Kramer isn't saying anything and just staring at George, Jerry and Elaine as they're kind of going, I don't want to upset Nazis. Look, I just got a phone call. And look, we just my his car broke down. And like, if you listen to each one of them individually, it's pretty funny. And I also like Dan's reaction when he sees Elaine. Elaine? It's my favorite scene because it's the last scene. Ooh, burn. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break, and I will see you on the other side. I just, uh, I couldn't believe it. (laughs) I I really thought I knew her, you know. uh, (sighs) I'm sorry. Thank you, Dan. That was Dan. It's still difficult for him to talk about. You see, Dan was completely blindsided by a shocking discovery about a former friend. One evening... 
this friend revealed herself to be something that Dan could never have prepared for. She was a neo-Nazi. While Dan's horrifying experience happened almost 30 years ago, his nightmare is just as relatable today. I don't have to tell you that being an ignorant asshole has become fashionable again, and people are letting their bigot flags fly high. If you've experienced the shock of finding out that someone you thought you knew is a racist, an anti-Semite, xenophobic, hates when black people vote, believes JFK Jr. is alive, supports insurrections by white people, believes the My Pillow guy has to do their own vaccine research when they can barely spell vaccine research, says they don't live in fear yet carries an AR-15 into a Joanne Fabrics, Scott Bayo. Maybe it's all of the above. No matter the type of ignorance, we can help. At Former Friends and Family of Dumbasses, we have counselors standing by 24 hours a day to help you grieve family or friends who have revealed themselves to be so stupid. I walked in on my salsa partner watching Newsmax and drinking his own piss to prevent COVID-19. I, I almost passed out. We had been dancing in the amateur salsa circuit for over 15 years. But with the support of former friends and family of dumbasses, my counselor made me realize it, it wasn't my fault. I mean, there was no way I could have known how fucking stupid he was. If you need help after a startling discovery of dumbasses in your life, please call 555 Come On. That's 555 266 3666 and get the support you deserve. Former friends and family of dumbasses. Because Holy shit, they are everywhere. And we're back. The extras were very underwhelming for this episode, so I'm just going to move on to Contributor Corner. Greg's thoughts this week, he says, I am not a big fan of this episode. It feels like an outlier, not filming on the usual sets and very little for Elaine or Kramer, but to stand by and chit chat. Yeah, agreed. I'm never a fan of shows who do off-site location episodes. Next, Greg says, I like the interaction between Elaine and Kramer alone, which we've not seen much of up until this point. JLD does a good job of humoring him with his basketball moves and then immediately seeming indifferent toward him when he falls into the trash cans. I like how she pops the gum in her mouth and looks away as if to say, I don't know this clown. Then, as they continue discussing what is going on with Jerry and George, I like how Kramer hugs Elaine tightly as if to protect her, and she fights him off. It's dumb slapstick, but because it's the two of them, it makes me laugh. Yeah, I mean, I think that the way Elaine reacts to everything Kramer's doing, I mean, Kramer is being so over the top that she has to be that way, right? She can't really, and that's how Elaine would be, of course, too. Like, when, like will you just relax? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the hug here. <laughs> Maybe I'm being just over overly sensitive about it now in this current climate, you know, but I yeah, somehow it just doesn't seem as funny to me. It used to. I I it is very slapsticky, but um just like the smushing her face. I think if she didn't say Kramer, you're hurting me. I I think I would still find it funny, but somehow her saying that kind of turns me off to that moment now. So whatever. It's not, it's just a little part of it. It is meant to be funny and it is funny, but I think just her saying it's hurting her kind of makes me feel bad for Elaine. Greg goes on to say, my favorite line of Elaine is when she says, I know Jerry, he's not a Nazi. He's just neat. It is a good line. Then Greg says, side note, I think the actress playing Ava here is the same who later plays Poppy's daughter who wouldn't eat Jerry's pie. I could be wrong. You are correct. Yes, Susanna Snyder, and she will come back and shake her head violently at the thought of eating Jerry's apple pie. <laughs> Lastly, Greg says, while the premise of this episode is ridiculous, I give them credit for doing something more extreme on a network show. Most sitcoms at the time were not talking about white supremacy, let alone making a joke of it. Yes, I'll get into that a little bit more in my final notes, but I, uh, you know, to find some positivity about this episode, I do recognize that as well. 
Thank you so much, Greg, for sharing your thoughts again this week. And if you would like to become a contributor, and I do want to mention, you know, Greg really goes the extra mile and sends many thoughts, but a contribution could just be one thought, or it could be just, hey, I love this line. You know, it doesn't have to be very involved. So if you would like to become a contributor with a wide range of what you want to contribute, <laughs> please email me at elainepodcast at gmail.com. That's Elaine Podcast at gmail.com. My favorite Elaine moments. Wow. Well, talk about a nothing episode for Elaine. It's been a minute since we had such an empty episode for Elaine, uh, comedy wise. But if I have to pick a favorite, I do like when she calls Kramer an idiot when he's going off on his theories about Jerry and George. <laughs> Listen, you idiot. The way she says idiot is always funny to me. So that is my one favorite Elaine moment. And my final notes, um, this episode is pretty out there, you know, it, and it doesn't gel very well with the rest of the series. Like Greg said, I think he said it very well. It's, a, it's an outlier. I do like this premise of taking a limo that's not meant for you. But, you know, I can see that being more of like Chandler and Joey doing that from Friends, you know, that that type of silliness would fit in with that uh, kind of a show um, on a more traditional sitcom. Now, going for the whole neo-Nazi thing, that was super edgy, very bold, which I do love. And I think that, I think even though the premise is good, but yes, it could turn into something very silly, like on a Friends episode, I think that they went for this neo-Nazi thing to make it <laughs> a little bit dark, and which was absolutely something that no sitcom was doing at the time. So I do love that. And I much credit to Larry Charles for going in that direction, because I think they were really just trying to say, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? <laughs> um, a Jewish guy having to, I think two Jewish guys. I don't know if George has ever been defined as Jewish on the show. But anyway, um, for all intents and purposes, two very no non neo Nazis being in a car with neo Nazis. Um, I just I, I think it could have been executed a little bit better, maybe in a more grounded way. Just bringing in the guns and the rally. Um, <laughs> I, I think it might be just hitting too close to home right now with the current climate and uh, how scary things are right at this moment. But I even felt it was over the top before the world turned in to an insane place. So yeah, I just for me, it's a little bit too out there, a little too farcical for me. And of course, you guys know what I'm going to say. I'm sure you can smell it coming. More Elaine. I mean, we needed more Elaine screen time here. And if I were to do scene swap, I know I could have just used less time in the limo, um, for sure. And more of Kramer and Elaine interaction. And by that, you know, something with just the two of them that didn't involve Kramer just going off on these conspiracy theories. I mean, Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Michael Richards, they're magic together. And as Greg says, you know, we don't see them alone in their own plots together. We'd certainly not up until this point. And as the series goes on, you know, we get a handful of those, but they are just so funny together. So I wish they would have come up with something unique for both of them to do waiting on that street corner rather than it be like all of their um, conversations be like an offshoot of that A story, which it was a weak A story as well. So I think that's all I can say about the limo. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time. 